Oh, for the love of the seven moons, they sent us another one, I grumbled, my forearms crossing simultaneously in what I hoped was an impressive display of disapproval. The data pad in my lower right hand displayed the transfer orders that would surely be the death of my career, my sanity, or both. Commander Blix Tarveen, that's me, the poor soul in charge of combat training at the Galactic Military Academy on Station Nexus 7. 20 stellar cycles of pristine service record, now potentially ruined by a single transfer order? The universe has quite the sense of humor. Commander, my assistant, Officer Rax, nervously chittered, their antennae twitching in that particular way that always preceded bad news. The human cadet has arrived early. Early? My scales bristled. These death worlders don't even respect basic temporal protocols? They say she, uh, ran here. Through three sections, up 47 levels. I blinked all three of my eyes in sequence, a habit my therapist says I need to work on. The artificial gravity is set to 1.3 standard units today. Yes, Commander. And the atmospheric pressure is currently at high calibration for our Jovian students. Also, yes, Commander. And she ran for fun? She said, and I quote, wanted to get a feel for the place. I needed a drink, something strong preferably radioactive. The doors to my office slid open with a hydraulic hiss, and there she stood, Cadet Andrea Rodriguez. The data pad listed her as 1.7 units tall, but somehow she seemed to fill the entire doorframe. Her dark hair was pulled back in what I would later learn was called a tactical bun, and her eyes, by the void, those eyes held the same look I'd seen in apex predators during my field studies. Commander Tarveen! Her voice boomed through the room with enough force to make my ceremonial medals vibrate. Cadet Rodriguez reporting for duty, sir. But please, everyone calls me Steel. Steel? I managed to keep my voice steady, professional. That's not a standard human designation. She grinned, showing far too many teeth. Lost a bet with a cargo loader bot. The name stuck after I won the rematch. Behind me, I heard Officer Rax drop their data pad. You challenged a Class Four Autonomous Lifting Unit to a strength contest? Oh, no, sir, she laughed. Actually laughed. That was just the first round. The arm wrestling was round two. Round three was the dancing competition. I made a mental note to check our medical base capacity and maybe request additional funding for structural repairs. Cadet, steel, I began trying to regain some semblance of control over the situation. You understand that the Galactic Military Academy has never successfully graduated a human candidate? Her grin widened, if that was even physically possible. First time for everything, sir. Besides, the last human only failed because the space walk training suit couldn't handle their backflip. I brought my own suit. Their backflip, I repeated slowly, during a space walk. Standard human celebratory maneuver, sir. Though personally, I prefer cartwheels. Officer Rax had backed all the way to the wall now, their chromatophores cycling through various shades of panic. Looking down at my data pad again, I noted her preliminary test scores. They had to be errors. Nobody scores that high on reaction time tests. And the strength evaluation? The equipment must have malfunctioned. Spectacularly. Three times. Well, cadet, I straightened my posture, all forearms clasped behind my back in my most authoritative pose. Welcome to Nexus 7. Try not to break anything on your first day. No promises, sir. She snapped off a crisp salute. But I brought my own repair kit, just in case. As she bounded, yes, bounded, out of my office, I turned to Officer Rax. Cancel my appointments for the next cycle and get me direct lines to engineering, medical, and that therapist who specializes in death world or induced stress disorders. Already done, sir, Rax replied their voice barely a whisper. Should I also alert the kitchen about increasing the structural integrity of the dining hall tables? I sighed deeply. Better make it the whole dining hall. The seven moons help us all. This was going to be an interesting training cycle. Three units of standard gravity, nice warm up, Cadet Steele's voice echoed through the testing chamber. When do we start the actual assessment? Sergeant Krasinak's mandibles clicked rapidly a clear sign of distress. The burly insectoid turned all four of his sensor arrays toward me. 
his exoskeleton practically vibrating with concern. Commander Tarveen, he buzzed quietly. The human has been in the gravity chamber for 43 minutes. She's, she's doing one-armed push-ups. I watched through the observation window as Steele continued her exercises, humming what she called an ancient earth workout melody. Something about eyes of tigers and rising up. The gravity chamber's readout blinked steadily, confirming that yes, we were indeed at three times standard gravity. Perhaps, I suggested hopefully, the calibration is off? Checked it six times, sir, Krasinak's antennae drooped. After the fourth time, I had Chief Engineer Sparkplug verify it personally. The other cadets pressed against the observation window, their various appendages and sensory organs tracking every movement. Cadet Brightscale, our top amphibian recruit, had turned an impressive shade of shock purple. Okay, okay, Steele called out, bouncing to her feet. Ready for the strength test now. Which machine should I start with? I pointed to the standard Mark VII resistance processor. Begin with basic lift capacity evaluation. The safety protocols are crack. The machine's main lifting bar rated for up to 12 tons of pressure bent at a 45 degree angle. Steele stood there holding the twisted metal, looking genuinely apologetic. Sorry about that. She carefully placed the mangled equipment down. I forgot to account for the gravity multiplication factor. Math was never my strong suit. Want me to try again with less force? Less force, Sergeant Krasinak repeated weakly. His exoskeleton had taken on a distinctly pale hue. Moving on to the endurance assessment, I announced quickly, before any more equipment could meet an untimely end. Cadet Steele, please enter Chamber B for the standard cardio evaluation. She jogged over, jogged in triple gravity, and entered the chamber. The rest of the cadets gathered around the monitors, various expressions of awe, fear, and confusion playing across their faces, tentacles, and photoreceptors. Beginning test sequence, Krasinak announced, his professional demeanor somewhat restored. Standard program Alpha 7, increasing difficulty every two minutes. Please maintain steady forward motion on the track. What followed could only be described as a complete dismantling of every known physical limitation in our database. Sir, one of the technicians called out, the chamber's having trouble keeping up with speed increases. We're approaching maximum velocity calibration. Steele's voice came through the comm system, barely even breathing hard. Everything okay out there? The belt seems to be moving kind of slow. Slow, Cadet Brightscale croaked. She's moving faster than a Centaurian speed pod. Then it happened. The gravity control system, pushed beyond its limits, glitched. Instead of a smooth increase, it jumped straight to six units of gravity. Every technician in the room froze. Krasinak's mandibles locked up entirely. Steele stumbled for precisely half a step. Whoa, nice surprise there. She laughed, laughed, and adjusted her stride. This is much better. Really feeling the burn now. Commander. Krasinak's voice had taken on a slightly hysterical edge. The safety protocols, they're not, we never. I know, Sergeant, I know. I watched as Steele continued running, now performing what she called high knees in gravity that should have turned her into a pancake. Submit the equipment replacement forms, all of them, and add a requisition for reinforced testing apparatus. What's the strongest material we have access to? Krasinak asked. After this? I'm not sure it matters. The other cadets had backed away from the window, forming small groups and whispering among themselves. I caught fragments of their conversations. Did you see how she... But the gravity readings were... My cousin said humans could. No way that's natural. Steele finally stopped running, not because she had to, but because she'd completed the standard assessment time. She emerged from the chamber, her face slightly flushed, grinning that unnervingly wide human grin. That was fun, though you might want to check your gravity regulators. Pretty sure they hiccup there for a minute. She started doing cool-down stretches that made several cadets wince just watching. What's next on the schedule? Sergeant Krasinak looked at his crushed data pad. When had that happened? And made a sound like a malfunctioning airlock. Combat. Combat simulations. Perfect, I love video games. 
As she bounded off toward the combat simulation chambers, I turned to Krasinak. Sergeant, how many spare simulation units do we have in storage? After last cycle's budget cuts? Two, sir. Better make it four. And Sergeant? Yes, Commander? Warn Technical Officer Moonweaver. Tell him to back up the combat simulation data. All of it. Already sending the message, sir. Also requesting additional medical supplies, emergency repair kits, and... He paused, mandibles twitching. Permission to update my last will and testament. I watched Steele's retreating form, still bouncing, despite the triple gravity. Granted, Sergeant. Granted. Technical Officer Plex Moonweaver's crystalline form reflected every overhead light in the simulation control room, creating a disco ball effect that perfectly matched my growing headache. His usually pristine facets had developed a stressed, cloudy appearance as he reviewed the incoming data streams. Commander, his harmonics vibrated with confusion. These readings can't be correct. The human cadet has exceeded the neural response parameters by, by, spit it out, Moonweaver. She's thinking faster than the simulation can process, sir. The combat prediction algorithms are crying. I stared through the observation window at Steele, who was currently immersed in our most advanced combat simulation pod. The external displays showed her virtual avatar facing off against 12 elite-level combat drones, four times the standard number for this test. How's she doing this, I demanded, watching as her avatar executed a series of moves that shouldn't have been physically possible even in virtual space. That's just it, sir. Moonweaver's crystalline structure chimed with agitation. She's not doing anything according to established combat protocols. The system can't predict her moves because they don't follow any known fighting style. Look, on screen, Steele's avatar had just thrown her virtual weapon at one drone, a completely inefficient move according to all combat doctrines. But before anyone could log it as a failure, She'd use the momentary distraction to sprint up the wall, kick off it, and take down three more drones with what she later described as a sweet wrestling move I saw in an ancient Earth entertainment vid. Impossible, Sergeant Krasinak buzzed from his corner. The simulation's safety limiters should prevent such actions. They're trying to, Moonweaver confirmed, but she's, she's exploiting loopholes in the physics engine faster than the system can patch them. It's like she's playing an entirely different game. Through the pod's audio feed, we could hear Steele laughing. Hey, these guys are pretty good, but you should see the training bots back on Earth. Now those things know how to party. The simulation's difficulty automatically increased again. 20 drones now, then 30. Steele's response? She started humming what she called her boss fight music and somehow began moving even faster. Sir! one of the junior technicians called out. The neural interface is reporting anomalous patterns. It's detecting multiple parallel combat strategies being formulated and discarded in microseconds. Moonweaver's crystalline form pulsed with alarmed colors. She's not just fighting, Commander. She's playing. Playing? I watched as Steele's avatar performed a maneuver that made several observing cadets lose their lunch in various species-specific ways. Yes, sir. Humans call it improvisation. She's making it up as she goes along. The system can't predict her moves because she doesn't know what she's going to do until she does it. The simulation's difficulty maxed out. Fifty elite-level combat drones surrounded Steele's avatar. The system, desperately trying to provide a challenge, had even removed the normal gravity constraints. Perfect! Steele's voice crackled through the speakers. Now I can really show you that zero-G breakdancing move I've been working on. What followed defied description in any known language. Steele's avatar became a whirlwind of impossible angles and devastating impacts. She used fallen drones as projectiles, turned their own attack patterns against them, and at one point appeared to create a makeshift gravitational slingshot using nothing but momentum and sheer audacity. Commander, Moonweaver's voice had taken on a desperate edge. The simulation's core processors are approaching critical temperatures. We need to shut it down before... The screens flickered. Steele's avatar froze mid-backflip. Then every display in the control room lit up with the same message. Simulation parameters exceeded. Reality engine breach detected. Emergency shutdown initiated. Please contact technical support. Have a nice day. 
The pod door opened with a hiss of compressed air. Steele emerged, her hair slightly disheveled, but wearing that same alarming grin. That was awesome, though it got a bit boring toward the end when I figured out their attack patterns. Did you know if you time it just right, you can use a drone's own plasma burst to boost your jump height? Really opens up some cool combo opportunities. Moonweaver's crystal structure made a sound like wind chimes in a hurricane. Commander, preliminary analysis suggests she didn't just break the simulation, she broke our understanding of combat itself. The data shows she was using techniques that our best warriors wouldn't even think to attempt. Because they're impossible? I suggested hopefully. Because they're too much fun, Steele corrected, stretching casually. You guys focus so much on efficiency that you forget the best solutions sometimes come from asking, wouldn't it be cool if... Efficiency is the cornerstone of combat doctrine, Sergeant Krasinak protested. Sure, but have you tried roundhouse kicking efficiency in the face while yelling really loudly? Steele demonstrated an air kick that made Moonweaver's crystalline form briefly shift into a defensive configuration. Sometimes the best strategy is to be so unpredictable that even you don't know what you're doing next. I looked at the smoking remains of our most advanced combat simulation system, then at the human cadet who had just redefined the meaning of combat improvisation. Technical Officer Moonweaver, update the combat training protocols, all of them based on what parameters, sir? How about we start with expect the impossible and work our way down from there? Steel beamed. Great idea, Commander. And hey, while the system's rebooting, anyone want to try some hand-to-hand -hand practice? I've got this great move I've been wanting to try. It's like a suplex, but with a twist, literally. The room emptied so fast you'd think someone had announced a hull breach. Just kidding? Steele called after the retreating forms. Mostly. I made a note to requisition more medical supplies. And maybe a physicist to explain how half of what I just witnessed was even possible. So, Steele turned to me, barely even winded. What's next on the schedule? Please say it's the obstacle course. I've got some theories about parkour and variable gravity fields. The seven moons give me strength. The annual survival course was designed to push cadets to their absolute limits. We'd carefully crafted an environment that simulated the harshest conditions found in the known galaxy. Temperatures cycling between freezing and scorching, toxic atmospheric compounds, and gravity fluctuations that would challenge even the most seasoned space travelers. Beautiful day for a walk, Steele announced, zipping up her environment suit like she was preparing for a casual stroll rather than a potentially lethal training exercise. Medical officer Lumina Star Whisper's bioluminescent patterns flickered with concern as she conducted the final health scan. Her silver skin pulsed with readings that made absolutely no sense. Commander, she whispered, her glow dimming to a worried blue. Her baseline adrenaline levels are higher than most species' crisis response states. And her heart rate, she's excited. Of course I am. Steel overheard us, her suit sensors already synced to local communications. Check out that acid rain. The chemical composition must be fascinating. Oh, and are those plasma storms on the horizon? Classic. Before anyone could stop her, she'd already bounded into the course. The other cadets followed much more cautiously, their environmental suits maxed out on protective settings. Beginning trial phase one, Sergeant Kresenak announced his mandibles still twitching from the combat simulation incident. Current conditions, temperature at minus 40 degrees, atmospheric pressure at twice standard, visibility reduced to boom. The entire station shuddered. Emergency lights flashed. A second explosion rocked the observation deck. Status report, I barked. Hull breach in section seven, a technician shouted. Three cadets trapped in the maintenance corridor. Environmental systems failing in that sector. Impossible to reach them, Krasinak buzzed. The corridor is exposed to vacuum, and the emergency bulkheads are... Woohoo! All eyes turned to the external monitors. There was steel, using her suit's maneuvering thrusters to rocket across the gap between training zones, straight toward the breach. Cadet Steel, I shouted into the comm. Stand down immediately. That's a direct order. Sorry, Commander. Her voice crackled through static. Can't hear you over the sound of how awesome this is. Besides, those plasma storms gave me an idea. We watched in horror as she deliberately flew into one of the energy disturbances. 
using its electromagnetic field to supercharge her suit's systems. The readings went off the charts. That's not possible. Lumina's whole body pulsed with disbelief. The radiation levels alone should have... Time for some extreme space parkour. Steel's voice cut through the chaos. She ricocheted off debris, used microbursts from her suit's emergency tanks to adjust trajectory, and somehow turned the vacuum of space into her personal playground. The trapped cadets came into view on our monitors. Their suits were losing power, frost forming on their visors. Two Novarian gas breathers and a young crystalline, all showing critical life signs. Steel reached them just as the corridor's structure began to buckle. Hey guys, her voice somehow remained cheerful. Going down? I mean, technically we're going up and slightly sideways, but you get the idea. What happened next defied several laws of physics and probably created a few new ones. Steel rigged an emergency tether from spare suit parts, calculated a trajectory that accounted for the different mass of each species, and used the plasma storm's electromagnetic field as a makeshift slingshot. Remember to tuck and roll, she advised her terrified passengers. Well, except you, Sparkles. You should probably just stay rigid, crystalline structure and all that. They shot through space like a comet with questionable decision-making skills. Steel used her own suit's remaining power to guide their descent, somehow turning what should have been a fatal impact into a controlled crash through an emergency airlock. Medical Officer Lumina was first on the scene, her skin blazing with emergency response patterns. Her preliminary scans of the rescued cadets showed mild hypothermia, some gravitational stress, and several cases of what humans apparently called being totally stoked, dude. Steel! I managed to keep my voice steady as she helped her fellow cadets to their feet. Your suit readings? They're impossible. Oh yeah, the sensors probably got a bit scrambled during that last barrel roll. But check this out. She pointed to her suit's external plating, which had partially melted. The plasma storm's electromagnetic field created this really cool pattern. Think they'll let me keep it as a souvenir? Lumina's medical scanner whirred as she examined steel. Your core temperature should be critically low. Your radiation exposure exceeded fatal levels. The G-forces alone during that rescue should have... Should have what? Steele asked, helping the crystalline cadet brush off some space debris. Made things more interesting? Because yeah, it totally did. Hey, does this mean we get extra credit for the survival course? I looked at the massive hole breach, the traumatized but alive cadets, and the human who had just turned a lethal crisis into what she called a fun Tuesday afternoon. Medical Officer Lumina, I said carefully, Please update Steele's medical file. With what notation, sir? All of them, and add a few new categories. We're clearly going to need them. Already done, Commander. Lumina's skin rippled with bemused patterns. Though I had to create a new section titled Physically Improbable Events and another for Violations of Known Scientific Principles, Steele beamed at us through her partially melted visor. Does this mean we can go back to the survival course now? Those acid geysers looked really promising. And I've got some theories about surfing toxic clouds. Surfing toxic. Sergeant Krasinak's translator actually gave up and rebooted. Yeah, with a few modifications to the environment suits, we could totally turn this into an extreme sports training module. Anyone want to join? No? More fun for me then. I made a mental note to update the station's insurance policies. All of them, the championship arena buzzed with anticipation. Quite literally, since half the spectators were various species of insectoids, representatives from every major military force in the galaxy had gathered to witness the final assessment, though witness might be too mild a term for what was about to unfold. Anyone got a spare hair tie? Steele asked, casually stretching in the preparation area. This one's getting a bit loose and I'd hate to have to pause mid-fight to fix it. Sergeant Krasinak's mandibles clattered in disbelief. You're about to face the top five combat specialists from across the galaxy, and you're worried about your hair accessories? Well, yeah, presentation matters, Sarge. Besides, I've got this great move plan that involves a spin kick into a backflip, and proper hair management is crucial for maximum style points. The first challenger entered the arena champion razor scale of the draconian elite guard. His chrome-plated scales could deflect energy weapons, and his battle record showed 200 victories without a single defeat. 
Oh, cool. Steel bounced excitedly. I've never fought a dragon person before. Do you think he'd sign my suit after? The part that's still intact from the plasma storm incident, I mean. The match began. Razor Scale unleashed his signature move, a blindingly fast combination of tail strikes and claw swipes that had earned him his undefeated status. Steel ducked under the first strike, rolled through the second, and then started dancing. What is she doing? Technical Officer Moonweaver's crystalline form vibrated with confusion. According to her pre-match filing, I consulted my data pad, she's performing something called the Macarena to, and I quote, check the local gravity calibration and confuse her opponent. It worked. Razor Scale's attacks became increasingly erratic as he tried to adapt to a combat style that violated every known principle of warfare. The match ended with Steel using his own tail as a springboard to launch herself into what she called a people's elbow, a move that somehow combined wrestling, acrobatics, and sheer audacity. The next three challengers didn't fare any better. Steele approached each fight with a different style that seemed to be equal parts careful planning and complete chaos. Her combat pattern is, there is no pattern. Moonweaver's analysis systems were working overtime. She's combining techniques from 17 different martial arts, three dance styles, and what appears to be something called parkour. The fourth match ended with Steele victory dancing atop a knocked out Jovian Warmaster, humming something about being the champion and wanting to rock you. Then came the final challenger, Grandmaster Void Whisper of the Shadow Monastery, a being so skilled in combat that their movements couldn't be tracked by normal sensors. Now this is gonna be fun! Steel cracked her knuckles. Hey, Commander, remember how you said excessive backflips were tactically inefficient? Steel, don't you dare! Too late, she was already in motion turning the arena into her personal gymnasium. Grandmaster Void Whisper's legendary speed met its match in Steel's unpredictable acrobatics. The human fighting style Sergeant Krasinak observed with growing respect. It appears to be based on the principle of what if we did the thing everyone says not to do? That's not a principle, Moonweaver protested. That's madness. That's humanity, Steel called out somehow hearing them while in the middle of what she termed a super ultra combo move. The final match ended with Steel and Void Whisper both standing, breathing hard, and laughing. Most entertaining battle in three centuries, the Grand Master's whispered voice carried across the arena. Never before has one used interpretive dance as a feint. Thanks. I got the idea from watching those floating jellyfish things in the hydroponics bay. Speaking of which, want to grab some lunch? I've got so many questions about that shadow step technique you did. The award ceremony that followed was unlike any in the Academy's history. Steele stood on the winner's platform, her uniform somehow both impeccably pressed and artfully disheveled, sporting that now familiar grin. In recognition of unprecedented achievement, I announced, trying to maintain some semblance of formal dignity. Cadet Andrea Steele Rodriguez has not only passed the final assessment, but has forced us to completely rewrite our combat training manuals. Does this mean backflips are officially sanctioned now? She asked hopefully. We're creating a new category called human style combat techniques with a warning label that reads, results may vary, physics optional. The gathered crowd erupted in cheers, whistles, and various species specific sounds of appreciation. Several of the defeated champions were already asking Steele for training tips. Commander Tarveen, Steele approached me after the ceremony. Thank you for not throwing me out that first day when I broke the gravity chamber. Cadet, no, graduate Steele. You didn't just break equipment. You broke paradigms and possibly several laws of physics. Speaking of breaking things, she grinned sheepishly. I might have accidentally discovered a new way to modify the training simulators while celebrating. How do you feel about anti-gravity obstacle courses? Behind me, I heard Sergeant Krasinak whimper softly. You know what? I surprised myself by saying, show me. But first, explain something. How do you humans do it? How do you turn everything, even combat, into something so joyful? 
Steele's grin softened into something almost philosophical. That's easy, Commander. We look at all your rules and limits, not as walls to stop us, but as challenges to overcome. Also, she winked, everything's more fun with a backflip. I made one final note in her file. Warning, enthusiasm highly contagious. Exposure may result in spontaneous innovation and unauthorized fun. The galaxy would never be the same. And maybe, just maybe, that was exactly what it needed. The emergency meeting of the Galactic Military Academy's High Council had been going for six hours. My presentation, titled Adapting to Human Combat Innovation, a case study in controlled chaos, was met with a mix of disbelief, horror, and grudging admiration. So let me get this straight, Chancellor Vex Prime's tentacles curled in agitation. Not only did this human graduate, but you're suggesting we actively recruit more of them? With some facility upgrades first, I clarified, displaying the repair costs from Steele's training period. Lots of upgrades, and possibly a complete redesign of our insurance policies. The hollow displays showed footage from Steele's final months at the Academy, training sessions where she taught other cadets her freestyle combat philosophy, clips of her turning environmental hazards into what she called parkour opportunities, the now infamous incident where she proved that, yes, you could technically use a plasma containment field as a trampoline. The data is conclusive, technical officer Moonweaver chimed in, his crystal form still showing stress fractures from analyzing Steele's performance metrics. Human unpredictability, when properly channeled, creates combat effectiveness that our traditional methods simply cannot match. Or predict, Sergeant Kresenak added, his mandibles finally steady after weeks of therapy. Or contain, or survive without significant property damage. The medical department's representative, Lumina Star Whisper, projected her findings. Her bioluminescent patterns form graphs showing Steele's physical achievements. Their adaptability is unprecedented, she glowed enthusiastically. During her time here, Steele's body actually improved under conditions that should have been lethal. They don't just survive adversity, they thrive on it. And now she's suggesting we open a new training program, I continued, pulling up Steele's proposal. Something she calls extreme combat parkour, when normal violence just isn't fun enough. The council chamber erupted in concerned murmurs. We've already received 400 human applications, I pressed on. Apparently, Steele's been posting about her experience on something called Spacegram. The post went viral, Moonweaver explained, though I'm still not sure how a data transmission can contract an illness. Her most popular video, Sergeant Krasinak brought up a hologram, shows her performing what she calls a sick zero-G kickflip during the station emergency. It has 7 million views in something called hashtag goals. Chancellor Vex Prime's tentacles tied themselves in a nervous knot. And these humans, they all want to train like this? Oh no, I corrected. They want to, and I quote, take it to the next level. Steele's already submitted designs for what she calls an epic space obstacle course. The engineering department had to take a group meditation session after reviewing them. The footage continued playing. Steele teaching a crystalline cadet how to properly crash with style showing a Novarian gas breather how to use their atmospheric jets for sick aerial moves, and somehow convincing a group of energy beings that they could, in fact, break dance. The most remarkable thing, Medical Officer Lumina added, her glow pulsing with excitement, is how she's inspired other species to push their own limits. That crystalline cadet, they discovered they could temporarily alter their crystal structure for enhanced flexibility. We're still studying the implications. Which brings us to the proposed changes. I pulled up the new Academy guidelines. First, all training equipment must be reinforced with, well, everything we've got. Second, we're reclassifying certain physics violations as acceptable combat techniques when performed by humans. Third, we're installing emergency fund dampening fields in all critical areas. Fund dampening fields? The Chancellor's translator struggled with the concept. Steele's suggestion, actually, she says it's only fair to give the instructors a fighting chance. The council reviewed the success metrics, improved combat effectiveness across all species, unprecedented levels of interspecies cooperation, and a 300% increase in what Steele termed totally awesome moments. There are risks, I acknowledged, significant ones, 
But there are also opportunities. The galaxy is changing. Maybe it's time our training methods did too. Besides, Sergeant Kresenak added, his mandibles clicking in what might have been humor. Steele promised to teach me something called a roundhouse kick next time she visits. The Council's decision was unanimous, if somewhat resigned. The Galactic Military Academy would officially embrace human combat innovation with appropriate safety measures and a greatly expanded emergency response team. As I finished updating Steele's final evaluation, I couldn't help but smile at her last message. Hey, Commander, quick question. How do you feel about jetpack jousting? Asking for a friend? Well, actually, asking for the 300 humans I just recommended to the Academy? Don't worry, I told them to bring their own repair kits. P.S. Thanks for everything. You guys taught me how to be a warrior. I just showed you how to make it fun. I added one final note to the official records. In conclusion, the integration of human combat methodology has fundamentally altered our understanding of military training. We must accept that the galaxy's definition of possible may need significant revision. Also, all future human cadets must sign a waiver acknowledging that physics is more of a suggestion than a rule. What happens next? Chancellor Vex Prime asked. That's the exciting part, I replied, watching as the first wave of new human applications flooded our systems. We have absolutely no idea, and somehow that's exactly how it should be. The galaxy would never be the same, but thanks to one human cadet who refused to accept limitations, it would definitely be more interesting and probably need a lot more repair kits.